So this reading is entitled, Why Do Devotees Fall? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. An endlessly fascinating question is, why did Judas fall after receiving the extraordinary blessing of being accepted into the, into the inner circle of Christ's disciples? For Judas was one of the twelve apostles, yet he betrayed Jesus and earned himself the opprobrium of Christendom for all... <laughs> Anyway, he earned himself a really bad name in Christendom for all futurity of his sin. We find, Jesus reprimand, we find Judas reprimanding Jesus just days before that betrayal. Jesus, aware that his disciples would soon be facing with his death the supreme tragedy of their lives, allowed Mary to express her devotion by anointing his feet with costly ointments. This act of wanton waste, as Judas saw it, awakened indignation in that disciple. I, I'm going to say before I go on, you know, for those of you who are newer, uh, these readings are... Uh, in the tradition of Yoganandaji's satsangs when he was alive and, and Swamiji did this, he reads from the Bible and the Gita and he draws comparisons. This actually originated when Babaji asked Sri Yukteswarji to write the Holy Science, which also compares the two scriptures. Basically to say Sanatan Dharma is in uh, the Gita as well as the Bible. We don't practice Christianity in some kind of a traditional way at all. Christ is one of our gurus, just like all our other gurus, uh, as a yogi, uh, not as uh, organized religion type um, uh, savior or something like that. So that's not how Yogananda taught about it. So I know in some cases, people have bad experiences with that. <laughs> uh, we've heard many stories. So try and have an open mind if this is a challenge for you, because it is part of our teachings, and you can't ignore it. And, um, and so have an open mind if you don't. If you already have an open mind, great. Uh, it's not about Christianity. It's about uh, yoga, sanatana dharma, and the truth behind all religions. That's what Yoganandaji was teaching. So that's why, for some reason, our gurus chose these two scriptures. They could have chosen other scriptures to compare, but because uh, probably majority of people are either one or the other in different parts of the world. Uh, and so um, that's why this comparison is done. So this, this week is emphasizing the Bible a little bit more, and that's why I wanted to make this comment. <laughs> so to continue on, uh, these are the quotes. This is what Judas uh, is basically saying. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and kept the purse and bare what was put therein. Then Jesus said, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye not always have. Doubt not the power of delusion. This is Swamiji writing now. Doubt not the power of delusion. Respect it. Indeed, fear it, though not in the sense of cowering before it. For as Yogananda said, one is not safe until he attains Nirbhikalpa Samadhi, the the state of final union with God. Judas, though attached to money, opened his consciousness to subtle influences which may be called satanic, that drew his thoughts toward other related attitudes. The importance of worldly power, for instance, and of worldly influence. The Bhagavad Gita gives a graphic explanation of how easily the mind can be drawn downward once it begins to feed on wrong attitudes. In the second chapter, Sri Krishna states, If one ponders on sense objects, there springs up attraction to them. From attraction grows desire. Desire, impatient for fulfillment, flames to anger. From anger there arises infatuation. 
the delusion that one object alone is worth clinging to, to the exclusion of all others. From infatuation ensues forgetfulness of the higher self. From forgetfulness of the self follows degeneration of the discriminative faculty. And when discrimination is lost, there follows the annihilation of one's spiritual life. At the first thought of delusion, Paramahansa Yogananda said, that is the time to stop it. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. This reading is from Whispers from Eternity by Paramahansa Yogananda. This one is entitled, I want to hear thy song in the silence of my soul. Thy gentle voice saying, come home, I often heard. But through many lives it was drowned in the tumult of my wild cravings. I have forsaken the jostling crowds of desire. In the solitude of my mind, my devotion bursts to hear thy voice. Take away every dream memory of earthly sounds that yet lurks in my mind. I want to hear thy still voice ever singing in the silence of my soul. Well, this topic, how devotees fall, as, as Swamiji begins the reading, it's an endlessly fascinating question. And he uses this example uh, of in the life of Jesus, of one of his direct disciples, Judas, partly because it's somewhat unique. We don't actually have, at least I can't think of any, perhaps you can, uh, stories that are so clear where a guru is, very, uh, is openly betrayed by a very close disciple. A guru may be persecuted by whatever challenges there are, or a guru may have very close disciples who are very supportive. If you think of the Mahabharata war, by and large, there are just two sides, and they're very clearly defined. You don't have somebody who's kind of wavering in the middle, maybe Bhishma, maybe Drona, but again, they are more the elders. They're, you wouldn't really think of them as Krishna's disciples like you would the Pandavas. So we don't have one of the Pandavas had a bad day and then suddenly betrayed Krishna or anything like that. So we don't, we don't really have a very clear example in the life of Rama. You don't say that Kaikeyi was a really great person and generally well-loved and respected, but she sort of said the wrong thing and then tortured Dasaratha and the whole family. No, she's just portrayed as just bad. And un unfortunately, uh, in, then that's not very helpful for us on the spiritual path. In fact, it's even misportrayed in the Bible too much that Judas was a thief and was only caring about money. And Master said it's not true. Swamiji asked him, was Judas a, a great soul? Was he a prophet? And Master said he would have had to have been to be one of the 12 direct disciples. So then it becomes interesting as to how could it happen that someone could be so elevated and yet also fall. Now why is it relevant? Because we can see this in ourselves and in the lives of great masters, some in the lives of even great disciples, that the that they they can be very highly advanced in some ways and yet still have something they're working on. And they can sometimes have a flaw expressed that just seems that, that even a normal person, so to speak, less developed than they would know better than to, for example, speak so sharply or whatever it is. If the guru speaks sharply from calmness, it's because he's just trying to help you. And Yoganandaji had that. Swamiji had that. But I wouldn't claim that for myself, nor would I think any of us say, if I say it, it comes from God. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, be careful with that one, because God may say, <clears throat> with a lightning bolt. And so the, the thing is that, again, I'm not saying this that we then take a catalog of people we know and say, yes, but you still have this problem. No, that's the wrong road. It's also to be aware in ourselves. And there's a whole interesting aspect to it, because that's relevant. First of all, as I said, Master said, 
Judas was a great disciple. So we have to remember that he was great in his understanding. There was a lot he had going for him. Still, though, he had this problem. And it begins, it's even hinted at in the first sentence. In the Bible, we find Judas reprimanding Jesus. Hmm. Why is the disciple <laughs> sitting there correcting the guru? But you see, it happens all the time. Even in our own minds, it can happen. We can read something and say, huh. I wouldn't have said it that way. I might have found a better way to say it. Or, huh, I don't know. Maybe that teaching isn't for me. That's for other people. You know, there'll be that voice in the mind that will just be rejecting. And it's understandable. The ego does not give in easily. It will find some way to try to pull back, to try to protect, because it feels threatened, and rightly so. Because it is threatened. You are not threatened. We are not threatened ourselves, because we are the soul. But that barrier, the soul identified with the body, with this life, with this pan number, and now Adar, too caught up and this is me, that is not true. And yet it's a strong hypnosis. So we have to be very clear that, um, that, that when we have these, these tendencies to be critical, to be negative, to be rejecting, or just to be low energy, that we say, well, I see that this is in me, and, don't, and, and be compassionate, as it was saying, face your faults, as we read in the affirmation, not condemning them, because when we condemn them, we just make it worse. And we say, I am this terrible, I am this bad, and the fact is you're not. I mean, as, as Swamiji said once, remember, Master's on your side, and don't worry if you're making mistakes. He said, if, I mean, look at how many people in this world are even seeking God consciously. Master pretty well has to adjust his expectations <laughs> down to an appropriate level if he wants to have anybody with him. We're trying. But this thought to be critical, and it comes from as Swamiji writes in another commentary on the same part, it comes partly from the thought, see, as wise as the guru is, in this I am wiser. And I saw this all the time among, uh, not all the time, but I saw this among some people that I knew on the path during Swamiji's lifetime, that tendency to say, well, I think it really should be done this way. I had to watch for there were times in myself where I was confused and I thought, well, maybe the answer is actually this. In fact, when Swamiji would send out chapters of his books for a, a group of people to read before, uh, just as he finished writing the chapter, like he would finish it, send it out, then I, I learned that when I had a, a question or what might be, you know, maybe he meant this instead, a point that I was confused on, I would say, uh, perhaps, I'm sorry about, I'm confused on this point, does it mean this? Or perhaps I, it means this. Here's an example just to make it very, you know, this is not really a mistake. But in the answer script, in the original version, when Master meets Swamiji, Master says, I'm going to initiate you on this path. And you've all seen that scene in the movie. And he leads, he begins the prayer of invoking our gurus. And so I wondered, though, because it's just a prayer and it's not yet the vows, maybe it would be helpful, since he said, I'm going to give you these vows, to maybe say the first line of the vows or something just which actually is portrayed in the movie as it stands now but those are not the vows those are just something that was written for the movie so i said to swamiji i wrote to him perhaps it would be helpful to include the a line or two of the vows so people really understand what's happening but then i also said or perhaps you felt it was these vows are too sacred to just be included in a movie for the general public. And he wrote back, I felt these vows were too sacred to be included in a movie for the general public. In other words, I would offer something that I thought maybe was uh, an alternative, but I'd also offer exactly why whatever he did probably was right. Because if someone was confused, was it more likely to be me or to be Swamiji? Obviously, it was me. And so I would say nine times out of nine, that was always the case. So the thing is to be always tentative. 
Because sometimes we would bring up points and Swamiji would say, that's a great point, thanks very much. In fact, that is what I meant to say. Or he'll say, oh, I, you know, I wasn't aware of that. And who knows, there are many times when he was well aware of lots of things, but he would say, I wasn't aware of that. Or that's a good idea when five minutes ago before the person walked in, he had stated the idea himself to encourage everyone. And he wasn't being insincere because it was a good idea. As he said, who cares who is the source of the idea? But when we sit and think we know better, we should be careful. It, we shouldn't think that we know less, that we know worse we either. No, I know nothing. That's useless. God wants you to use your gifts, your brain, your energy, everything, and to increase it. But do it with God and do it with the Guru and in harmony. And we know if we're not going right. See, that's the worst part. As I should say, we don't always know when we're not going right. Uh, you just sort of, something feels slightly off, but it's fine. It's probably indigestion. I'll just keep marching in this direction. You know it, though, if you look in the mirror and the face is not smiling. It sort of has a, hmm. <laughs> then be a little careful. If the face sort of looks like stone, you know, because I am holding to my vision of the truth. It may be all well and good, but isn't harmony also important? Isn't it better to be a child? Trust your Heavenly Father, your Divine Mother, your Guru to help. Ask for help. Don't just be passive about it. But so this, this tendency to criticize is, that, is the thing we have to watch out for. It's, it's alluded to in the Gita. Krishna says to Arjuna, to you who are free from the carping spirit, I reveal these truths. And the carping spirit is that tendency to always criticize. And so, if you find yourself criticized, just say, Om Swaha. This is just a reminder for me to not do it to other people. And so, um, but be strong and true to your own vision of what, of what is right. Because <clears throat> if someone criticizes you, they're very pleased with themselves, but you're the one who has to sleep at night with the decisions you've made. And so stand by that truth. But the other thing to remember is that um, Jesus, if you don't know the story, or Judas rather, betrayed Jesus to the authorities that were coming for him, towards Jesus, and that led him to be crucified and killed. So the disciple led to the guru's own execution. It doesn't get worse than that. And yet, Master said, because Judas, as the story goes, unfortunately after that, when he realized, why did Judas do it? Master said Judas expected Jesus to use a miracle to save himself. So he wasn't setting him up. He wasn't sending him to jail. He was thinking, if only he would show his miraculous powers to everybody, then they would all listen. And how many people do you hear saying that? I just need to see one miracle and then I will take level one. Can you levitate just a few inches? huh? Because otherwise, how do I know? Even Babaji said it's easy to believe when you see some miracle like that. It requires no great skill. There's nothing impressive about a devotee who believes after seeing some dramatic miracle, and maybe it's their own karma or whatever in the rare cases that it happens. Because why? Even if you do. As Trilunga Swami said to the one disciple who was yearning to have a miracle, so the Murti of Kali came to life and sat down and spoke with them and then came back and went back and turned back into the Murti. What a blessing, sort of, because Trilunga Swami said, now what have you got? How has it changed you? Are you in Samadhi now? Do you, are you resolved to live a better life so the Murti will come to life again? So what? You know, if it's just hocus pocus, this kind of magic, does it really change us? So it takes, because as devotees, we are always looking to the unseen. We are looking behind the veil. We are trying to listen for God's voice beneath the noise of even our own thoughts, because it's there. And so why not get into that habit now, even at, the, at any time on the path? It takes much more devotion, interest, faith, and your own understanding, because there's something in you that knows there is something out there. I can't quite see it, I can't quite hear it, but I can feel it. Because when I go in this direction, I feel better. And when I just go in the direction 
of worldliness without God, I feel worse. I feel dry. I feel empty. There's something missing that no amount of eating <laughs> or watching movies or spending time with friends, there's a hole that cannot be filled. And so that is the understanding of a devotee, and that's why we all do what we do. So with Judas then saying, I want him to show a miracle so that we will also have the approval of society, because that was another thing. The powers that be, if he, they would just, we could get the chief minister on our side, we would be set, this kind of thing. So he was going for that, which is to say, worldly influence as well. What, who was the chief minister, or who, whatever it's called, during Jesus' time? Nobody knows. That's my warning, that I better wrap it up. That nobody knows, but we know Jesus' name, and we know more than just his name, the teachings that have been so helpful. And again, this example is a, a unique one. So Judas was horrified. To, to see that, Judah, that Jesus did not save himself, allowed himself to be killed, which is something he never expected, as proven by the fact that then Judas took his own life. Now, and so it's kind of a sad story. It's more than a sad story. But Master said, Judas should not have done that. He should not have killed himself. Whereas you would think that people would just be applauding, here, here, save me the trouble, that kind of thing. No. He said he should have gone into the mountains and meditated and tried to, and prayed for, for, for purification, for forgiveness of this great sin, and that would have helped him to go forward having made this terrible mistake. Now, I don't think that any of you betrayed someone on your way here this morning or sort of, you know, led some, you know, did some false, uh, led to some false arrest before breakfast. So, if Judas himself should have just meditated <laughs> and offered, you know, him, himself for purification, then whatever it is that we've ever done or will ever do, we should always just say, oh well, what's done is done. I don't like this feeling of having done it. I know it was wrong. I release it into the infinite. Remember what Master said, whatever is in the past is in the past. It does not belong to us anymore. Why does God wipe our memory between each incarnation? It's just not worth it. Master said we've had plenty of bad things happen to us, or we've done. And he kind of gives us a fresh start with sort of a blank, you know, memory. No, no, I'm fine. No, no problems here. He said, otherwise, if you died of cancer in your last life, any little boil you have on your hand, you'd be terrified that the cancer had come back. So just as we wipe the slate lifetime to lifetime, let's do that now. Don't ever say what I did was wrong, but it doesn't matter. No, in the sense that, or it wasn't wrong. That's what Master said. Always acknowledge it was wrong, but that's okay. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. Let me resolve to do better. Sometimes one great mistake is all it takes for us to say, I will never do it again. And so always, again, give yourself that encouragement because we're all going to end up in God. It's just a question of when. And so let us go home even in this lifetime.